Hello everybody, how's it going? As many of you already know, one of the regular series that appears on this channel is my top 10 of the year videos. Within those videos, I share recommendations for films that I love, and I've covered from 2008 all the way up to 2015. However, I had only started including guilty pleasures on those lists starting in 2013, so there's a bunch of guilty pleasure type films from 2008 to 2012 that I never wound up including. There's also great films that should probably be on the actual lists themselves, so some because I've reconsidered their quality, and others because they flew under the radar. There's some directors that I wound up discovering later and found that they made films for those years that I had already made lists for. So here's a list of recommendations in no particular order that should serve as kind of a list corrections video. I'll be making a few of these as time goes on, so this video won't include everything that's missing, but I figure this is a good way to get some content out while I'm working on my new YMS review and other projects. Starting off this list, we have Take Shelter, directed by Jeff Nichols. This film probably should have been somewhere near the bottom of my 2011 list. I would probably call this Jeff Nichols' best film, and this is definitely one of the best performances from Michael Shannon. He plays a man who essentially feels as though he's losing his mind. Plagued with nightmares and a never-ending sense of foreboding danger, he becomes certain that there's a gigantic storm that's coming to kill him and his family. It's a very dramatic film with a powerful performance that makes it really easy to care for his character. Don't really want to say too much about it, I guess, so just check it out. You think you could help me with something? What do you need? I'm gonna build out the tornado shelter in my backyard. I could use some help. The hell you wanna do that for? This needs to be done. What do you need? I figure I'd do it on a Saturday, borrow some equipment from work. You sure about that? Yeah, I just need a backhoe, hauler. I'll rent the rest. Yeah, whatever, I'll help. Thanks. You all right, man? What do you mean? I just don't want to see you fuck up. I'm not. Next up is Cabin in the Woods, which probably should have been somewhere near the bottom of my 2012 list. This is a horror comedy film written by Joss Whedon and directed by Drew Goddard. Anyone familiar with horror or slasher movie tropes is sure to enjoy this, as it's a really meta deconstruction of those types of films. It basically acts as both a love letter and a parody of the genre, while also succeeding at being a hilarious comedy. Even though this is primarily a comedic film, it still doesn't use that as an excuse used to abandon presenting its horror elements faithfully. It succeeds at doing both very well, and there aren't that many films that you could say that for. It is a fun and riveting experience with some incredibly satisfying scenes. So watch this one with some friends and have a good time. What is that thing? Oh. I don't know, but there's more of them. More of them? I saw a young girl, all zombied like him. She was missing an arm. Oh my god. Patient. The diary. Look, we're gonna lock this place down. He's right. We'll go room by room, barricade every window and door. We gotta play it safe. No matter what happens, we have to stay together. Fuck. Calm down. Watch the master work. This isn't right. What? What's the matter? This isn't right. We should split up. We can cover more ground that way. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. Really? <laughs> Next up is Trash Humpers by Harmony Kareen. And this is one that I'm definitely gonna have to specify as a guilty pleasure type film. Harmony Kareen is one of the strangest directors out there right now. Plenty of his films are presented in kind of an ironic way, and many people who view his films find it incredibly difficult to determine what exactly his intent was. I definitely wouldn't call this film some sort of masterpiece, and you're not gonna find any real profound meaning within it. But what this film does do successfully is 
stand out as its own experience, it's safe to say that this is one of the more bizarre movies you could watch. It is an experience that is both simultaneously hilarious and incredibly uncomfortable. It's oddly disturbing and just so fucking weird. I definitely would not recommend this film for everyone, but if this weird-ass movie looks like it could be interesting to you, then check it out. I flip over like this in my bed, which I'm, I'm always comfortable in my bed. And I flip over like this, and I get like this, and I raise up, and I raise up like this, and, then, and he tells me to act like I'm holding an orange underneath my neck. And I hold this for 60 seconds. And I've already done this once today, so I don't need to overdo it again. And then I drop back down, and I do it another time and hold it like this, and... Get her down! Get it down! Don't tell me what to do. You're not my doctor, and you, uh, you have no responsibility to be telling me what to do. Get it down! Next up is Sasha Baron Cohen's Bruno. This is a follow-up film to the monumentally successful Borat, but this one features his character Bruno that is also from the Ali G Show. This movie is filmed in kind of a half-documentary, half-fiction kind of way. As he's performing his character, he finds gullible people and makes them look like idiots, pushing the envelope as far as he can and seeing exactly what he's able to get away with making people do or say. If you love awkward, cringe humor, this movie is way up there in that sense. It's in incredibly well acted and well written. There's plenty of satirical social commentary to be found as well. I personally feel as though this movie is just as good as Borat and even better in some ways. This is an incredibly hilarious film that pushes boundaries and doesn't compromise. And I probably should have included it somewhere on my 2009 list and I don't know why I didn't. If you enjoyed The Ali G Show or Borat or Who is America or haven't even seen any of those, I would strongly recommend this movie. This is one of the more outrageous comedies out there. I wouldn't recommend watching this one with your parents or anything as it's pretty vulgar and often potentially offensive but i really love this movie so if this is funny to you then i'd suggest checking it out uh, is your baby fine with lit phosphorus yes excellent does he like it loves it oh god a little sensitive subject here how much does she weigh she's about 30 pounds 30 pounds yes approximately can olivia lose 10 pounds since the next week the next week, seven days, yeah, I'd have to do whatever I could. If there's a problem losing the weight, would you be ready to have Olivia undergo liposuction? If that was the last resort and she didn't lose the few pounds, then yeah, we'd have to do that. Great, fantastic news. We have chosen your baby mm -hmm. to be dressed as a Nazi officer, pushing a wheelbarrow with another baby as a Jew in it, into an oven. Into an oven. Congratulations. How do you feel? Great. If she got the job, that's, yeah. that's great. Next up is a found footage horror film called Wreck 2, a very satisfying sequel to the film Wreck that I also thoroughly enjoy. This movie picks up right after the first one ends, so if you haven't seen that, then check that out first. This is without a doubt one of the better examples of found footage horror done right. Every scene is a creative new opportunity to utilize the genre to its fullest potential. I really love that they took the concept from the first film and added a lot more to it. There are some people that don't enjoy that this one took a more supernatural approach, but I personally love that they used it as an opportunity to create new and interesting set pieces and filming techniques. It easily could have been a carbon copy of the original, but I feel as though these new elements help the film more than anything. This is a movie that requires some suspension of disbelief as it is a horror movie, but the way that it's shot and presented is just so exhilarating that it never really prevents me from being scared. This is an exciting and action-packed horror movie that had me on the edge of my seat. This is not a perfect movie, but it definitely deserves Serves a spot somewhere near the bottom of my 2009 or 10 list or perhaps the guilty pleasures section maybe. Either way, if you're a fan of exhilarating horror movies, then I would recommend you check this one out.
Next up is a film called Julia, starring Tilda Swinton. This is one of the more interesting and bizarre thrillers out there. The main character of this film is an alcoholic, and she's not exactly portrayed as clever, but that's part of what makes it work. There is a huge focus on character development in this film, and Tilda Swinton pulls off this character rather flawlessly. Quite honestly, she's probably my favorite actor at this point. She puts so much depth and care into every single one of her roles, her performances are filled filled with realistic subtleties. Tilda Swinton is an actor that truly transforms when she's performing, and the way this film is shot really helps bring everything out for the audience. Certain shots in this film will pan from the actor's face to show more of their body language. It's a movie that you can really tell cares about its characters. This is not a perfect film, and I do have some issues with it. The child actor has some scenes where he's not really all that great, but overall this is a very fun and unique thriller with a fantastic character study to go along with. It. This probably should have been somewhere near the bottom of my 2008 or 2009 list. This movie didn't nearly get the attention it deserved, and it's something that I think everyone should watch at least once. So go check it out. You've got family problems. I've got family problems, too. I've got lots of problems. But you know what? I still come to work every day on time. Okay, look, Frank, um, I'm, I'm gonna pull myself together, right? I mean... What are we talking about here? I got drunk once. One or two drinks at lunch. But since I've been here, I have been really good. I have been on time, all my appointments, all my meetings, everything. Ask Mitch. Um, yeah. That's not what Doreen did. Doreen, oh. Hey, hey, and the way you talk to her, you know what? I'm sorry, but this is going to end right here. Frank! Oh, I really wish this had turned out better, but I'm sorry, Mitch. No, 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 you don't have to be sorry. I'm the one who is... I'm sorry. Julia's sorry, too. Right, Julia? Doreen's Julia? Doreen is fucking saving our own fucking lazy fat ass. Fat fucking ass bitch. Fucking fat ass bitch. Fucking yeah, Julia. bitch. Julia. Next up is Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog starring Neil Patrick Harris. This is actually a three-episode web series from Joss Whedon back in 2008. It was released online for free and it was pretty popular on the internet at the time. Basically, this is a parody superhero comedy musical. An interesting combination for sure, but it all works together really well. This isn't really something that I can praise for mind-blowing cinematography or production value. It is kind of shot more like a TV show than an actual movie, but regardless, it is is a very funny and enjoyable experience, and the songs were also very catchy and well written. Personally, I find the soundtrack to be the best part of this show. Neil Patrick Harris does an amazing job singing, and this is the type of soundtrack that just loops on in my head long after it's over. With a total runtime of 42 minutes, this is such a low commitment that you might as well just give it a try. Not sure if this should have been on my actual 2008 list or the guilty pleasures, but either way, I really enjoy it, so check it out. You always say in your blog that you will show Show her the way. Show her you are a true villain. Who is her, and does she even know that you're... Laundry day, see you there. Under things, tumbling. Wanna say, love your hair. Here I go, Hi, man. I'm mumbling With my freeze ray I will stop the world With my freeze ray I will find the time To find the words to Tell you how How you make Make me feel What's the phrase? Like a fool 
kinda sick Special needs Anyways With my freeze ray I will stop Next up is Tim and Eric's Billion Dollar Movie. This would definitely be on the Guilty Pleasures list of 2012 and not the actual list itself, because this movie doesn't really have much to offer outside of its humor. And even then, their comedic style is fairly niche. If you've never heard of Tim and Eric before, then I would suggest watching Tim and Eric awesome show Great Job. If you like that, then you'll like this. If you don't like that, then you will not like this. If you're finding season one difficult to get into, then I would suggest skipping to season four, as that is probably the most accessible and my favorite season. If you get what they're going for and it clicks well with you, then it's pretty hilarious, but I can definitely understand when people say that they absolutely hate it. It's bizarre, ironic, intentionally funny, bad kind of humor, where sometimes the humor is found in how not funny it is. One could even call their brand of comedy anti-humor in a way. Anyway, they're a really unique and important voice in comedy today, whether you like them or not. If this seems funny to you, then check it out, but if it does then you probably should not even try. So check it out, maybe. Jim Joe, we have to let you go. I'm sorry. It's all over, Jim Joe. It's okay, Jim Joe. Breathe. Breathe. Jim Joe? Oh. Next up is Kim Jong-il's Comedy Club. If you have a difficult time finding this movie, then you might want to try searching for its original title, The Red Chapel. This is a documentary from controversial Danish filmmaker Mads Brugger, the same guy who directed The Ambassador on my 2012 list. In this film, he travels to North Korea with two Danish-Korean comedians under the guise that they'll be performing a musical comedy show. But the actual intent of the visit is to be more of an expose. Now, this film doesn't really expose anything about North Korea that you wouldn't already know, and keep in mind that this was originally aired as a TV series in 2006, so I'm not sure exactly how common knowledge the issues that are talked about in this film were back then. But this isn't exactly a film that I watched to learn about their regime. This is a documentary that succeeds through the characters that are featured within it, whether it be the North Korean tour guide or censorship board, the comedian with spastic paralysis, or even Mods Brueger himself, who provides very very intriguing and surprisingly introspective commentary throughout the film. It is so incredibly fascinating to watch these characters throughout the film. It's one thing to hear about censorship in North Korea, but it's an entirely different experience to watch it play out in motion. It's unsettling, it's funny, and it's oftentimes endearing. Now one could easily make arguments against the exploitative and borderline reckless nature of the film, and those are ones that Mods Brueger acknowledges himself, but whether or not you consider him to be a shitty person for making this movie, it is a legitimately fascinating and engrossing experience that I would recommend people check out. The North Koreans surgically removed everything of Danish origin from the comedy show and replaced it with the story and content made up by Mr. Jong Se Jin, their director. If our comedy show had suffered from a lack of logic, continuity as well as quality, the North Koreans replaced it with a show which was even more bizarre and grotesque. The only Danish elements that survived the censorship were some rudiments of Mrs. Christoph, which seemed to have impressed the North Koreans. Apparently, cultural exchange in North Korea is a one-way affair, which means that you only exchange North Korean culture. So let's make one story all together into one. It's but well, what about uh, their songs and what about the small stories from Denmark? <laughs> Uh, let's not do that, and uh, uh, only this story makes it, make it uh, very interesting. But, but now it's gone. Why? Why? All, all the work we have done is gone. Oh, can you go ahead? 
그 부인이 나는 거 있지. 안 내가 없어서 딱이니까. 어. Anyway, let's try to in this way. Yes. And the last film that I will talk about in this particular video is Once Upon a Time in Anatolia. This is from Turkish director Nuri Bilge Selan, who has made many films that I love, my favorite of which would probably be Winter Sleep on my 2014 list. This is the first film that I saw from him, and it probably should have been on my 2011 list somewhere. But I think that my initial problem was that I wasn't really expecting a film to be so slowly paced. This is one of the best examples of nighttime filmmaking I can think of. Many of the shots feature smooth and fluid camera movements. The locations and landscapes are absolutely breathtaking. From a visual standpoint, this movie is pretty fucking perfect. The characters in this film are well-developed and filled with plenty of interesting conversation. My only real issue is that the core plot of this film takes a while to move along in the first half. It is best to be prepared for a very slowly paced film, but it is still incredibly beautiful. The sound design in this film is incredibly If you're looking for a fast-paced movie, then this is probably not the one to watch. Perhaps try starting with his film Three Monkeys, as that is probably the most traditionally accessible film that I've seen from him. Anyway, if this one looks interesting to you, then check it out. And that's it for this first list correction slash guilty pleasures video. I did not include every film that I could have, but I will be making more of these in the future. Anyway, I hope that I've introduced you to some new films that you enjoy. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.